I asked Jim to read those verses. They talk about the negative so uh, of how we use words and how we be judged by that. But our lesson tonight is going to be, though, on something positive that we can say. I, I've, I've talked about this before, and I've talked about it just most recently at the uh, devotional we have for our staff each Monday. And I was asked by one of the elders if I would go ahead and present that tonight. Uh, primarily, I guess, because it's only about 15 minutes long. We won't have an abbreviated service. Apples of gold. It's based upon a statement that you find in the book of Proverbs, chapter 25 and verse 11. Where the wise man said, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in baskets of silver. When we talk about a word fitly spoken, we're talking about a word that is said at the right time by the right person for the right reason to the right person. A word fitly spoken. And he says it's like apples of gold and baskets of silver. It's my understanding from some reading I've done that in ancient days, when a king might give a great feast to invite in his dearest friends, and maybe those individuals who supported him in his life, they'd have this table set with the finest food, and the centerpiece of that table would be a basket woven of silver filled with golden apples. And sometime during that dinner, the king would give a sign to one of his servants and he would stand up and take that bowl of apples and walk around and invite each member present to take one of those apples. It was a perfect gift from a king. And when Solomon thinks about that, he says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and baskets of silver. It's like the king that one might receive, or like a gift that one might receive from the king, something to be highly treasured and, and loved. And as I thought about these, I, I've talked about before, uh, about words of encouragement. Those are words that are fitly spoken. And certainly words spoken for the master. Times that we would inform other people about Christ and encourage them to live for Him. Certainly those are words that are fitly spoken. But the ones that I chose for the devotional last week and the one we're using now may seem a little bit odd to some people because I'm talking about humorous words. I think humorous words also are words spoken at the right time for the right reason to the right person can be indeed a word that's fitly spoken. It can be of value to people in life. I, I don't think I'm unique in this, but I love to laugh. I love funny jokes, I love funny movies, I like to be able to just laugh and enjoy myself in, in times like that. I, I told them that I can remember when I was younger, and we would get a copy of this magazine, maybe someone would bring in, Reader's Digest. You see that? That's where I would always turn first thing, laughter, the best medicine. Some of the jokes may have been corny as they could be, but I always got a good laugh out of it. It always made me feel good. And, and I think that when you have good humor like that, it's something that can be of great value to you. I've even noticed this at times at funerals. I've preached a number of funerals, and I've been to a lot more funerals than that. And, and I've noticed that so many times at the visitation that family members will be there, and they'll start talking about some of the funny things that the deceased person had done in life. Or maybe some of the funny things that had happened, funny things that had happened to that deceased person. And I've often wondered why that would be the case. And, and I've noticed a lot of times too, even in funerals themselves, when relatives are asked to speak, they'll get up there and they'll have something humorous to say about their loved one. And I think really one of the reasons why they do that is to help relieve the tension, to be able to provide some kind of, of relief from that, that anxiety they feel and the sorrow at the loss of a loved one. There's a realization that humorous words can be of great value to people. One psychiatrist says, Woe to the man who loses his sense of humor. Laughter is the finest antidote for the acidity that eats ulcers in our stomachs. Humorous words can be of great value to people. I, I told them about a, an incident years and years ago I was watching with my mother watching the old Jack Parr show. Now to those of you who are younger, Jack Parr was the host of what would become The Tonight Show, but that was before Johnny Carson. And for those of you who are younger, that was before Jay Leno. 
And that was before Conan O'Brien, and that was before Jay Leno came back a second time, and that was before Jimmy Fallon. But all of them were before Jack Parr, or excuse me, were before Steve Allen. He was the originator of it. But on this particular instance, Jack Parr was the host, and he had a guest on there. I cannot remember the man's name. But one thing I remember about this gentleman, he was talking about an event in his life at a time when he was suffering some of the most excruciating pain that one could realize. He, he said that, that it was such that even the slightest touch would cause him to draw back in pain at it. And he said when he, when he went to bed, he could not stand have any, even a sheet laying on him. It, it caused any movement that he had would cause severe pain to him. He was put in the hospital, and the doctors tried to figure out what was wrong with him, what was causing that, and they couldn't come up with any solution. And after he'd been there two weeks, and he spent a lot of money on those hospital rooms, there were some suggested, maybe you just need to leave and get you a, a motel room here close to the hospital, and let us see what we can find out about this, and if we need to get you back in, we can get you back in quickly. And you'll save money, at least, on, on what you pay for that motel bill. It'll be a lot cheaper than paying for the hospital. And so he did that. He went there, and he had his wife to bring down a movie projector they had at home. And he had some contacts with people in the movie industry. And he had his wife to go down and pick up some of the movies of the Marx Brothers. Now, if you don't know the Marx Brothers, you don't know what it is to laugh. He sat there and he watched a series of those movies. And he would just laugh and laugh and laugh. And he hit what my friend used to call the dying cockroach position. That's where you're on your back and arms and legs are failing. And you're just laughing so hard. And after a few moments, after a few moments, he called out to his wife. And she came running over to the bedside and said, what, what's the matter? He said, I just realized I'm not hurting anymore. He told the doctors about it, but they were incredulous that, that that would be the case, that when he was laughing so hard, he wasn't feeling that pain. But since then, doctors have learned a great deal about the value of laughter and what it can do for us in life. And, and studies have been done at Mayo Clinic in regard to this and let them know how, how valuable it is. There, there are certain benefits to laughter. In fact, they listed at least four different benefits. Number one... They said laughter relaxes the whole body. A good hearty laugh, they said, relieves physical tension and stress. It leaves your muscles relaxed for up to five, 45 minutes after the laughter. And I thought about how many times people will go to the doctor and they will spend money to get maybe some tablets that will help relax their muscles or maybe they'll go and have a, a massage to help relieve some of that tension. But scientists and doctors are beginning to realize a person who's able to laugh, genuinely laugh, can find relief in this way. Number two, they said laughter boosts the immune system. Laughter decreases stress hormones and increases immune cells and infectious fighting antibodies, thus improving your resistance to disease. It can help you to enjoy a healthier life in that regard. But the third thing that was mentioned is what really caught my eye in regard to this. They said that laughter triggers the release of endorphins. I had no idea what an endorphin was. But I got to looking to learn about it. And they said the endorphin basically is the body's natural feel-good chemicals. You don't need to get high on any drugs. Just laughter itself can help release these endorphins which make you feel better. They said that endorphins promote an overall sense of well-being and can even temporarily relieve pain. It has that ability. Amazing to me. And the fourth thing really was something that, that I was interested in. Laughter protects the heart. They pointed out that laughter improves the flow of blood, the blood vessels and blood going through and increases the flow which can help you protect you against a heart attack and other cardiovascular problems. All of that can be done through laughter. And I think when an individual can 
speak humorous words, to cause someone else to laugh, they're doing them a great service. They're doing things that can be helpful to them mentally and physically to help them to enjoy and have better health. But someone says, well, what does that have to do and, and what value is that in a spiritual setting where, where we be worshiping God to talk about humorous words? Well, I believe humorous words are words fitly spoken. And I believe that when one looks at the Bible, you'll notice that Jesus sometimes used teaching tools that were humorous. In the book of Matthew, chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount, verses 3 and 4, Jesus said, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is this log in your own eye? Can you imagine a situation like that? I thought if that had been put into a situation comedy, it would have been hysterical to people. Here is somebody that's got a piece of sawdust in his eye, and, and a brother across the room sees him, and he's got a big four-by-four four sticking out of his eye. And he goes over to that person and says, Hey, let, let me help you get that bit of dust out of your eye so you can see better. And he walks over that two-by-four, four-by-four out of his eye. He can't even get close to the man because of that. And any movement, he's hitting somebody else up against the head. And I, I couldn't help but think, when Jesus said that, did any of the disciples standing there listening to him maybe get a smile on their lips and begin to chuckle about that? The absurdity of it. But you see, sometimes absurdity can be used to point out the sins of people to make it much more powerful in convicting them of sin. And to understand their hypocrisy and how ridiculous it was Jesus says, it's like a man with a four-by-four four in his eyes wanting to go over and help somebody else that's got a speck of sawdust in his eye. Matthew chapter 23. One of the most scathing rebukes that our Lord ever gave to any individual or group of individuals when he spoke over and over again to those Pharisees and again and again he called them hypocrites. And as you come toward the end of that, in Matthew chapter 23, at, at verse 24, Jesus said, You blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Did you know the gnat was an unclean insect? Under God's law, there were certain animals, there were certain fish, there were certain insects that they couldn't eat because they were unclean. And so that Pharisee, who was so meticulous in keeping that law, making sure he'd do it the very best of his ability, He's out somewhere and somebody's going to pour him a drink and he has to wait. And he takes a cloth and puts it over his glass and has him pour the drink through that. And as he gets through, he looks down, aha. You see that gnat? I almost swallowed that. If I hadn't strained it, I would have swallowed that. And I would have been guilty of, of eating an unclean insect. How righteous I am. And then Jesus says that man turns around and swallows a camel. Well, we know, obviously, don't we? Nobody's going to swallow a camel whole. That's not going to be something that really happens. But again, if, if it was put in as a cartoon, you could see something like that happen. It would be hilarious to you. But again, Jesus is just pointing out the absurdity of how far these people would go in their hypocrisy. They're not really concerned about keeping God's law, about doing what's right. But they want to make a big show of it, and, and so they'll strain out that gnat. But in reality, they're doing something far worse, eating a whole camel. And so Jesus would use humor to try to help people to understand how absurd it can be for them to live in sin and do those things. So as I thought about these things, and I thought about, you know, the, the people at Reader's Digest, I thought, man, they're, they're pretty smart, aren't they? they, they they've gotten onto that idea. Laughter is the best medicine. But in reality, it wasn't those people who came up with that. That same man, Solomon, who said, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and baskets of silver, is the same man who also said in Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart does good like a medicine. God recognizes the value of a merry heart. God wants His people to be filled with joy. He wants His people to be happy in life. He wants them to be able to enjoy this life, to be able to laugh and to have a good time. 
But God also wants us to be able to laugh and have a good time in the right and proper ways. He wants us to be obedient to Him, to keep His law and do what He wants us to do. He wants people throughout this world to know who He is and become obedient to Him. That's why He had given His disciples the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The person that believes in Christ will repent of his sins, confess Christ, and is buried with Christ in baptism, has all of his past sins forgiven. The person who lives faithfully to God has that blood continually to apply to his life and keep him cleansed. So tonight, as we close out this part of our service, we want to again extend God's invitation to anyone here who needs to make your life right with God. If there's one here that's never become a child of God, we want to give you that opportunity tonight to become His child through your obedience to Him. If you're His child and you know you haven't really been living faithful to God, you haven't been serving Him as you should, to give you again that invitation to correct that by repenting of those sins and praying to God for the forgiveness that you need. And our God is a God who delights, who takes great joy in being able to give forgiveness to those who respond. If you need to come to him tonight, please do that now while we stand and while we sing.